We're here on the Nick Ant Podcast. This is Jordan Leffler, straight out of Montana. This guy is a recent Glacier National Park Conservancy Award winner, and he is a photographer and videographer. Jordan, what do you do for a living? Uh, I actually do video and photo full time. So I, I go, um, I do everything from documentary work um, to uh, private work for you know corporations, organizations, um, uh, corporate work. Uh, you know my own personal projects, uh, weddings, uh, pretty much the whole gamut. So are you, would you call yourself a freelancer or would you call yourself a business entity? I mean, it could be both. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, probably freelancer is good. Good way to do it. Yeah. I do partner, uh, with my brother Logan and he and I pretty much do everything together. Um, all of our video work is mostly just he and I working together. Um, and so, it's, it's nice to have him to, to help me. And then, uh, you know, we know, know a few other people that we work with on projects here and there. Awesome. So give me this feel. When did you pick up the camera? Was it when you were a kid? Was it late in life? Did your, the way you grew up have to play into you using a camera today? How did it all start? Yeah. So I actually got a skateboard for my, like my 10th birthday. And, um, picked up skateboarding and then pretty soon after I have two brothers, my, both my brothers got skateboards and then, uh, a few of our cousins got skateboards and then we had, uh, other kids in the school getting skateboards and pretty much pretty soon there was just, you know, a whole handful of us that started skateboarding around our tiny little town here in Montana. And, uh, it wasn't soon after that where, we were seeing what the professional skateboarders were doing, you know, and, uh, we, we got our first camera and we started filming, filming skateboard videos. And then, you know, pretty soon that transitioned to, I'm sure every, uh, young male growing up filmed a jackass video or two. (laughs) You guys are filming stunts. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Some stunts. Um, and then, we started into uh, sketch comedy or we doing some sketch comedy, me and my friends. Um, and that kind of went on through, through college. And, uh, then once I, once I got out of college, I was like, I can make a, make a career out of this. So pretty much for a long time, you've always known you wanted to do something with a camera. Was there ever a time like that you wanted to do something else or was it always, I'm going to do some with a camera? It was pretty much, pretty much, you know, since the beginning, I always gravitated toward that and creative storytelling and uh, film, photography and video editing. So as far back as I can remember, this is what I, I knew I wanted to do. So I feel very blessed that I, I, I figured that out early on. You were one of the very few to figure it out that young. I was fortunate to get into videography when I was a sophomore in high school so I can relate to you on that aspect just I've had a camera since then I retired for probably a year because I was doing other things and then I came back Mm -hmm. to it like this is what drives us yeah yeah so you went to college did you go to college for video or did you go to college for like something else so I went to the University of Montana in Missoula Montana and I went to the media arts school so it was uh at the time, it was um, like a split track where I learned both graphic design, Photoshop, Illustrator, and uh, film on the other side of it. So we we learned, you know, how to use Final Cut and uh, you know, how to set up interviews and um, run cameras. So I got, I feel like I got the best of both worlds. Okay, so you went to college. A lot of people in this space don't go to college for that. <laughs> they always recommend don't go all that. What is your opinion on that? Do, should they go? Should they not go? What do you think? Um, I think it's up to the individual. Um, there are, I feel like there's, there's people that kind of need a structured learning and, uh, 
kind of need that need that routine to wake up and go to class and learn something every day and have a project that the the professor you know puts in front of them that they need to to work towards but then there's other people i feel like can you know wake up watch 10 youtube videos a day and uh learn everything they need to know from that and i know um i actually didn't take any uh photography classes in in school because they had drawing prerequisites i had to take and i was like i don't have I don't have time. <laughs> so I didn't actually do any still photography. Um, okay. So like most, most of that I picked up after college just through YouTube and, you know, going out trial and error with my brother. And um, so I, I'm definitely a believer that you could do either. I mean, college isn't for everybody. Uh, so if you, if you feel like you're self-motivated enough to, to go out and learn on your own, then go for it. One last thing on that. So you did it for video. Would you say you've learned a lot of stuff on the job as in for video production as well as photography? Like there's things that probably school couldn't have taught you and maybe you had to have failed a couple, failed a couple of times on set to realize, oh, maybe I needed to do this. Yeah. So the the uh, the school I went to was – a lot more focused on, I would say, the kind of traditional Hollywood style of filmmaking where it's, you know, a bunch of people on one set working towards one film. And I think the the game has changed so much that uh, a single person can grow, can go and do, you know, the, the, the work of a whole crew almost because the equipment's much more forgiving it's higher quality you know and technology's just advanced so much that um i i did learn once i got out there how to do a lot more uh by myself and instead of just focusing on um you know being the the gopher on a hollywood set who has to work his way up to like finally being the cameraman after you know 10 years um so it was kind of like a, a learning curve where I, I did have to learn to be be a little bit more independent and to, to learn to wear many hats rather than um, just focus on one thing in particular. That's awesome to hear because as a newcomer into this space, I'm doing a couple of video productions and I'm quick realizing, oh, I need to make sure I have enough time to set up my audio equipment, my lighting equipment, my camera is my transmitter going to my audio right and that's so true i'm people don't realize how much soloists do and mm -hmm. then once the budget gets bigger then you're allowed to have someone come help you and then you're like <sighs> you're like okay now little. now yeah. i have a guy yeah. setting up my lighting for me and i can focus on the overall story of what's going on right 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 and i i definitely think that uh there are you know, if you show up with more guys on a crew, um, it takes less time. Oftentimes it's a, you know, somebody might be an expert on audio or an expert on something. And so you can get uh, maybe a more high quality finish, you know, polished project. But it's amazing what one guy can get accomplished with all the tools we have available today. And I do... Uh, I am lucky to have my brother so that when we do, when we, you know, oftentimes we can be like, okay, only one of us needs to go to this. Like it's simple, maybe a two camera setup, you know, yeah. to film one person. But if it's like we're driving across the state and we have, you know, three stops and we got five interviews and uh, we'll be like, okay, this is a two, two man job. We're going to need to show up with lights. We're going to need to show up with, you know, four cameras, drone, all that. So there's definitely times when we pick and choose mm -hmm. when to be solo, when we can uh, manage it with two people and whatnot. Man, Jordan, what's it like to share this with your brother? I mean, you guys share the same passion that you think that like you guys play off each other and what's yeah. it like to share it with a family member? Definitely. Uh, so my, my little brother, Logan, he's one of my best friends. So we, uh, we do everything together, fishing, hiking, um, photography, you know, road trips. Um, 
I, I'd say probably 80% of the time I'm taking photos, I'm with him. And, uh, it's, it's great. He, I learn a lot of things from him. I think he learns a lot of things from me. Um, and I know I can count on him. I know I can rely on him to, to get the job done when, you know, I'm, I'm not there or I know I can lean on him to help me when, when, uh, I do need him, but we have a great, great working relationship and great, you know, personal relationship. We're very close. So it, it's, uh, I do feel, feel very blessed to have him in my corner. He wasn't quite as, as lucky as I was. He didn't, uh, he didn't know what he wanted to do up until a few years ago. <laughs> so he, he went into college thinking maybe he was going to do some, uh, like be like a personal trainer. And then he thought maybe he was going to get into business. And, uh, he did actually end up, um, dabbling in media arts a little bit. He took a few media arts classes, um, but graduated with a business degree. And, uh, then after he graduated, that's when like he picked up photography and videography and, um, just took off with it. And so it, it's, it helps to have me with, you know, my background that's more focused on the media arts and then, um, him to have some of his background with the, the, the business degree that he got. So I think we make a good pair. That's awesome. And to add on to that, I know I've worked with my dad on projects and there's just a different level of trust you have with a family member. I don't know what it yeah. is. I mean, you grew up with them your whole life. So there's just that connection that flows easy. So when you guys are working together, you're like, oh yeah, my bro's got this. And oh, I yeah. can imagine that's like a really awesome feeling to have. Yeah. And we actually had a, um, we filmed a video for our, our high school that went viral. It was about, um, it was a suicide awareness video and it ended up getting a million and a half views on Facebook and, uh, it got like national attention and wow. we had this news crew or not a news crew. We had a film crew come out from New York and, um, I sat in on some of the shoots that they did and mm -hmm. just like one guy's from Russia, one guy's from this place, one guy's from this place. And they, they didn't really mesh very well. There was a lot of arguing and there's a lot of um, contentious situations. And um, I was like, I am blessed to have my brother. <laughs> like rarely ever do we, do we butt heads. And so like, to your point, um, it's nice to have somebody in your corner that, you know, has your back that, you know, you can rely on and, um, you can, you can, you know, joke with them. You can, you know, it's not all serious. And so, you know, if I'm, if I'm stressed out, he can help me take the edge off. Same, same with him. If he's stressed, I know what, what'll help him loosen up. So it's a great, great thing to have is, uh, working, working with my brother. All right, so I remember you telling me a while ago now that you grew up on an Indian reservation. So have you always been there your entire life? And does that play a role in how you take photos now? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we we went to the, the high school. Um, so our town is called Arlee, A-R-L-E-E, -E, Montana. And it's on the Flathead Indian Reservation. And it's just north of Missoula, about 25 miles. And uh, we we lived here pretty much our whole life. Um, lived in Missoula for a few years just recently and then moved back this year to Arlie. But uh, pretty much our whole lives we lived here and went to the school here. And I feel like it was a very, uh, it was a really good upbringing that we had here. Um, our, our grandma is an enrolled member of the Salish tribe here, uh, which makes me and my brothers, uh, for second descendants. And so growing up, we were, we were exposed to a lot of the native American culture around here. And even in elementary school, I remember we had, um, Salish language class. And so we had a, a teacher who would come in and she would, uh, teach us Salish words, like, uh, uh all the animals. Um, we learn like basic, uh, addition and subtraction and, um, everybody got to pick a Salish name. So mine is Sinchetla, which is coyote. 
And, um, even today I'll see my Salish teacher and, you know, that might've been 20 years ago. And she, she always, uh, she always recognizes me and says, which is like, good morning, coyote. Yeah. And, uh, so I feel like we were, we were very blessed to grow up and be exposed to that. And that culture of, um, you know, you hear about early Native Americans when they'd go bison hunting and they would kill a bison and they would use every single part of it. You know, they'd use the bones for certain things. They'd use even the bladder from the bison. They would, you know, empty it out and it would become something to carry water in or something. Um, so it was like a, it's like a culture of um, respecting wildlife, respecting the land and, um, you know, not wasting, um, not taking more than you need. And so I, I do feel like that has played a big role on um, f- focusing my photography on wildlife and landscapes and, uh, you know, using that medium to educate people to um, share the beauty of our, our natural and public lands here in Montana and helping people respect those, those natural spaces so that uh, people for, you know, the next generation can, can enjoy the same places that we do. That's amazing. And I want to touch on the thing you told me just recently that we shared a common, me and you both are both videographers for our high school for the sports teams. So you also wrestled up, I remember you telling me, and you videoed for football. What was all that balance, like where you, you were playing sports, you were videoing, like what was all that, what was going on there? Yeah. So I, both my brother and I wrestled from kindergarten through our senior year in high school. So we had a long, long stint and we did the summer wrestling. And, um, I think in a big way that, that helped shape us. And I'm sure you know how hard wrestling mm-hmm. is and, um, uh, it being yeah. a, a solo sport, there's like nobody else to, to depend on but yourself and like, <laughs> yeah you can't point the finger at a teammate for you know a shot that they missed or whatever it's like you yeah. can only blame yourself and i think uh that that definitely shaped me and my brother and um you know our work ethic and i didn't actually start uh filming my high school until the year after i graduated so when i graduated Uh, my little brother was still in high school and, um, I remember, uh, when I was in high school, our wrestling coach made us a a highlight videotape and it was about 20 minutes long and it, you know, had all the, all the kids on our, on our team, you know, it was set to music. And I just remember thinking like how cool that was and how moving it was for me to just like see all of us up on there to this awesome music soundtrack and we're doing you know, the best moves that we've done all season and just how, how moving that was. And I wanted to keep that going. So the year after I graduated, I, I kept the tradition alive and, um, you know, I made a highlight video for my, my little brother's wrestling team. Uh, I did it for the football team. And then, uh, after my brother graduated a couple years later, I, 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 I still kept it going. And I got him to help me. And then by that time, we had we had done um, uh, football, wrestling, boys and girls basketball, and even volleyball. And uh, this is a, a school where we are Class C in Montana, which is almost the like the smallest class. There's a there might be one or two below us, but we have anywhere from like a hundred to 120 kids in the high school at any time. Wow. I, yeah, I think there was 110 when I graduated. And uh, I think it was it was a fun experience to to be able to provide that for our our uh, our community and um, our school. These like really high quality uh, videos that um, kind of our, our whole community could could rally around. I remember us doing, um, community dinners and showing the highlight videos and it was a really cool thing for us. And, um, we had, I think 
it's like four, five years ago, we actually had a, uh, uh, in about a two week span, we had about seven suicides in our, in our town of 600 people. And it, uh, it was the the thing I mentioned earlier. We we got together with the the high school boys basketball team and we filmed a uh, a video as they were going to the state tournament, like the next day. So we filmed this video and um, uh, posted it on Facebook, and it it just went viral. And the boys ended up winning the state championship. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, we had this video that go out that was like really powerful and really moving. Um, yeah. And it was, you know, young, young adults um, in high school talking about suicide and the problems with suicide and kind of breaking the stigma that it's not OK to you know talk about that thing. And um, we got the the uh, the governor from New Jersey sent us a video with our governor from Montana. We got. um we got the attention of, of Nike and they actually invited our basketball team down to their campus in Oregon. And, uh, we stayed there for a few days what? and yeah, oh, dude, and we got the whole um, works. Yeah. The, uh, the, the school got brand new Nike, uh, N seven, which is their native American themed, um, line of clothing. They got school, got brand new N seven, basketball jerseys for both the boys and the girls and uh it ended up we got like a like a twenty thousand dollar grant i think for um the uh uh the school system for to put in you know better practices for mental health and so a lot of a lot of good things happened um just from you know us taking the time to to film these kids and sports and it it was a really cool really cool experience and um i think it was uh it changed a lot of people's people's lives and um it just i i think it showed just shows the power of power of video and how how that can affect people and how much how how much change you can make just through just through video you know, a hundred percent agree. I started out with video in high school and then I always said photography is boring. I'm never going to do it because video is so much more exciting. And then I switched over the photography, abandoned video. So now here I am four years later now trying to learn video again. And now that I'm getting better at understanding how to tell stories and I'm like, when it makes me feel something, then I realized, oh, wow, this is going to make someone else like feel yeah. something, right? And like, that's yeah. a special feeling. And for your video to go viral, that is amazing. Especially, you said your town is 600 people? 600 people, yeah. And your whole entire high school at that time is just 100 people. Yeah, yeah. So I want to point this out, okay? <laughs> my high school, my gra- my senior class only, our graduating class was 700 people. Just <laughs> oh the senior God. class. <laughs> Bigger so, than our our whole town. <laughs> so think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is. <laughs> okay, so all four yeah. classes. That's probably around. Like, we have about two thousand kids at our school. Wow. That. So, yeah, it's special that it went out and affected that many people. But I think it probably feels better to you that the people who you see every day in the grocery store, in the the feed store, and all that stuff like that, that hits a lot harder because those are the people that you know them. You see them every day and. Yeah. That's probably what hits different to you. I mean, at least I think that would hit different to me. Yeah, it was. And we had um we had people messaging the basketball. We had a Facebook page for the team. We had people messaging the basketball team Facebook um saying, you know, this video saved my life or this video saved my son's life. Um and uh I have a I have a kid that I uh, that saw that video and he actually, you know, reported it from another town. This kid, uh, saw the video and he, he reported, uh, um, uh, a note that one of his friends left. Um, and, the the teachers and everybody were able to intervene before anything was able to happen to her. And I still keep in contact with him and his mom 
and uh, he's now I think he was in seventh or eighth grade and he's now a senior so it's it's cool to see um see kind of the ripples that have come from that and uh to see you know that we we did a lot of good in our in our own community and um and you know elsewhere in montana and um he's a he's a native american kid and uh so it makes me feel good that um that our message was able to, you know, to get out to other people and, um, just goes back to the power of video. And I, I, you know, back in the day, I wasn't, <clears throat> wasn't the most, uh, you know, outgoing and, you know, spoken person, a little shy, uh, but through the power of video, it's like, that's where you can find your voice. You don't need to, you know, get up on a podium and speak to, speak to a bunch of people it's like if you have a voice and you want to use it and you know how to use use video well you can you can reach a lot of people and do a lot of good you know what they say is art is a form of expression and i know a couple people fantastic photographers right fantastic Mm -hmm. and you get them on camera or you talk to them they're they can't talk that well but they can express a whole story and movie there's through photos right a single and image it's crazy they're like yeah but when you talk to them they're like they can't talk and it's right, crazy right that everyone has their own medium mm-hmm. yeah and everybody's got I their do voice think that you can learn different skills but i think that you always are going to have your strongest one that comes natural mm-hmm. so for some people it's photography some people it's doing sculptures for you it's doing video and I think that's pretty awesome, especially when nowadays that you can share all of that at all times. That's yeah. pretty special. I want to talk about this. Montana is considered one of the last natural areas in the United States, especially in the lower 48. Obviously, you have Alaska, but nobody visits there. So Montana is <laughs> pretty much the last wild in the United States in the lower 48. Does preserving the land play an important role in your photography? Because people don't live there, right? So the population there is small. And nowadays you got people traveling, geotagging on Instagram, mm-hmm. TikTok, and all stuff like that. Does protecting your home play a role in your photography? I mean, I know you go to all these beautiful places and you don't share it. And I'm you know share where it's at. I'm fine with that. I don't want people to mess that up. Yeah. I mean, I have national forests right down the street from me and mm-hmm. I don't share those smaller places because they can't handle the crazy crowds one. Right. Two, I would be upset if the whole area got messed up. So yeah. what's it like for you? Do you feel a responsibility as a photographer to uh, protect your home? Yeah. So our one of our, our state's slogans is the last best place that we kind of tout, you know, like you said, as being being one of the last places that's beautiful and wild and undiscovered. And um I actually just finished a film, documentary film, uh, in the spring, and we titled it The Best Last Place, which was a play off that. And it chronicled pre, like a few months before COVID, all the way through the pandemic up until um, just recently. And what we are seeing here in Montana is a huge influx of -of out-of-state people coming in uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, You know, you have people that just, they've seen the beauty in Montana and they want a little piece of that for themselves. Um, They want to be closer to, you know, places like Glacier or Whitefish, um, Big Sky, the Ski Hill. And then you had a lot of people, uh, we call them COVID refugees that were, you know, looking to get out of a big city because of, um, every, all the, the hoops we had to jump through with COVID and they're looking for, you know, wide open spaces. And, um, a lot of what we're seeing here in Montana is our land and our houses are being bought by out of state owners and they might come and stay there for a few months in the summer when the weather's nice. Uh, but other than that, they will Airbnb the house out or um, the house might 
just, you know, stay dormant. And it's putting a lot of pressure on our, our, uh, our, ho- our housing markets, our, our towns, uh, because you have this house that somebody owns and it's only available for Airbnb. And so that house is then off the market for somebody who, you know, might want to move to a town of 600 and, uh, become a teacher you know if we needed a teacher here there there might not be any housing because it's just not available and we actually did a um in our documentary we we touched on you know kalispell and what they're seeing up there um the the park and what kind of traffic is coming through glacier and over to bozeman which is the fastest growing city in montana and um yeah but we, we really focused on this little town called Phillipsburg and it's a little mining community that had a, it was almost a ghost town, very close to becoming a ghost town and had a resurgence in the, the, uh, nineties. And, um, it like has won multiple national awards for like the cutest little town, the best, you know, um, best painted town. And it's this really, really neat place. Um, and that's where I work uh, with the a guy on documentaries named Jim Jenner. And he and I have done, uh, I think, four documentaries together, as well as countless other projects. But um, we really focused on Phillipsburg because it's kind of a, a microcosm of what's happening everywhere else throughout the state. And I think something like, 10% of the, the housing in Phillipsburg is um, off the market. It's Airbnbs and um, they they are losing uh, enrollment in the school because they can't find teachers and they can't find teachers because there's no housing available. And so it's it's kind of a scary, um, scary situation we're looking at here in Montana. But um, you know, to tie it back to my photography, I, I'm very careful about, you know, what I, what I post and, you know, where, where I might say it's at. Um, a lot of the time I'm not going to say where it's at because, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with the, with social media and how, you know, one Mm -hmm. spot might just like one post might just ruin a spot for the, you know, foreseeable future. And so, a lot of my photography is, um, I keep it quiet where I shoot and, um, I'm sorry if, if you've commented on one of my posts and asked and I didn't (laughs) respond, but, um, yeah, it's, it's hard for me to kind of let that secret out because, um, you have a lot of people who aren't really educated in leave no trace principles and, you know, staying on trails, um, not not throwing trash on the ground. Um, so if you, if you get a lot of people that aren't really, you know, that educated flocking to a spot, um, it can ruin the, ruin the plants, ruin the flowers. Um, one of the things that drives me nuts in Glacier is seeing people feeding the, uh, like the squirrels and the chipmunks and all the little animals, you know, it's like, you don't realize how detrimental that is to them. It's a chain. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And like these, these animals are then going to be no longer self-sufficient. They're not going to know how to forage and find food on their own. And, you know, other animals might rely on that animal for, uh, um, for food or might rely on that animal in, you know, a lot of indirect ways, but it's like, I don't know, just so easily you can kind of throw off the ecosystem of a, of a place by not not practicing the leave no trace principles, which, you know, go all the way from staying on trail, not trampling flowers to feeding animals and whatever else in between. So, you know, a part of the leave no trace principles is to not share locations. Yes. And yes. The part where I'm kind of confused about Jordan is this whole Google earth trend thing, right? <laughs> they, they, pin, they pin the location, okay? They're putting some like discrete locations, and then in the caption it says "leave no trace." So, <laughs> um, I'm just a little bit confused about that. 
And a lot of people aren't willing to take the time to search these places up, which is why they rely on these Instagrammers mm-hmm. to show these locations. The yeah. Instagrammers are posting these because it gets them views. And then they say leave no trace, but that's not really leaving no trace. And I know that I, I try to not share anything, which I don't ever really, because I want to protect these places. And mm-hmm. obviously, like, people just don't put in the work to find these places. You can find them if you look hard enough. Like, I yeah. don't I feel bad asking them. Like, sometimes people, like, even friends, I don't even want to ask them sometimes. I'm like, bro, like, I promise I'm not going to share it. But sometimes I was going to Google Earth. I find it for myself or you do do enough deep enough research you can find these places right but at that point if you're doing that much research on a place you're more likely to respect the place at least i think so because there's some places i found like i looked really really hard to find them in mm-hmm. because i know i found it and like i was like not nah, many people can find this like i'm gonna go over there and i'm gonna treat it with respect yeah i'm not gonna tell anybody about it take yeah. a photo i'm gonna leave because I know Yosemite, you've have you been to Yosemite? I haven't yet. It's on the list. Okay. okay, so you've probably seen pictures every spot. So you probably feel like you've already been there, right? <laughs> and you, they, we have our fair share of tourists. And one thing that they do is they leave plastic sleds there. And the plastic sleds break on the snow. And so oh. they just leave it. And that's a huge problem right now because... We have animals getting introduced to plastic, and I know one time I was on the trail, on the waterfall trail, and this couple, they were sitting there, I think girlfriend was recording, guy was feeding the squirrel cheetahs. I was literally watching this, and they look at me, stopped recording, put the cheetahs away. So what's crazy is some people know that it's not okay, Right. I'm sure for you, being in Glacier, it's an up-and-coming national park in terms of popularity and all that. So you're starting to finally see all those crazy tourists that I mm-hmm. see all the time. I see them all the time, man. Yeah. So for you, you guys are like, been chilling all this time. All of a sudden, all the people are coming. You're like, kind of questioning if these people know anything. You're like, wow. You know, it needs to be like an education class before they walk in the park. Like, here are the rules. I mean, you have it on the maps, but how much more do you need? Right. What can we do to uh, help improve this awareness of protecting the parks? I yeah. Think. You know, it's it's funny you you talk about that map transition trend, Nick, because I it was about two years ago I did a hike and I figured out how to do that Google like zoom in thing. And I was like, whoa, this is really awesome. I can pretty much match the shot in Google of the the photo that I took. And I created one. And But I was like, do I really want to post this? And I thought about it. And I was like, no, I, this doesn't, like, this goes against leave no trace principles. So even though it was, like, really cool and I thought it was pretty clever, I was like, it's probably isn't best that i post this though i never did and to see that trending now it's just kind of like i don't know it's kind of sad and like you said our yeah our park is getting uh, a big influx of people and we get i think we get three million people through our our park in a year and that's That's the same as yosemite that's only in three months because our park about 90 percent of our park is closed in the the winter months yeah. So we have like a giant influx of people that come in in the summer and, you know, to the point where they've they've instituted these uh, ticketed entry systems. And the first year it was um, only on going to the Sun Road. And then the next year it was on the, the west side of the park at the, uh, the, the North Fork entrance. And now they're going to have it on pretty much every entrance. Um, including the east side. And I remember when they first came out with it, how kind of upset I was. And because, you know, you're used to having all this freedom and you're used to being able, being able to go in and out as you please and, you know, enjoying these public spaces. And I remember being really upset at first. And after I thought about it and after I 
had gone through that, um, that first summer they did the ticketed entry system. I was like, you know what, this is probably best for the park, best for the land and the animals that we, we do limit the amount of people that are going through there every summer. And it also provides a, uh, a better experience for everybody who's in the park because you don't have bumper to bumper traffic up going to the sun road or, you know, you don't have parking lots that are, you know, so full that people are parking on the side of the road and places they're not supposed to. And so I've, I've, I've done a 180 on the, the ticketed entry system and I, I, I appreciate it because I, I would rather, rather we do that and, um, preserve the park as it is and, um, keep it available for future generations, then be selfish and want to be able to go in and out as I please. So, um, yeah, it is tough. How do we, how do we, how do we educate people to, to, uh, to respect these places where, you know, you and I have grown up and because of that, you know, it's our home and we love it and we're, we're able to, you know, put that in perspective and do what's right for the, the land and the, the spaces. But, you know, some other people that aren't from here and they move here or they, they come here and visit and don't respect it as much as, you know, you or I would, it's, it's tough to see. I know my brother and I were, uh, shooting at Lake McDonald and Glacier, uh, er earlier this, this spring. And, uh, we saw a guy take his drone out and put it on the ground and he's just about to launch it. And we said something to him and we're like, dude, these are, you can't have these in parks. Like you can get a fine, you can get kicked out. Um, they're not, not legal in parks. And he go, Oh, okay. And we, we walk down the shore about 30 yards and sure enough, we hear, and there goes the drone out over the lake. And we're just like, Dude. Oh man. So even, Dude. even if you educate people, there's, there's still people out there. They're like, yeah, I don't care. I'm going to do this because I, I'm going to get the shot that nobody else is going to mm -hmm. get. So I don't know. It's it, tough. It is. It is tough. Cause I'm not, not trying to like be a gatekeeper. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to make sure the land stay protected. And mm -hmm. I'm sure you feel the same way. I'm like, not trying to say it's all mine. You guys yeah. can't have it. That's not yeah. what I'm trying to do. Like, yeah. the ticket of entry, we had that in Yosemite for the last three years. I've been happy with that. Yeah. Very happy. And this is the first year that they're going to take it back. Oh, they really? They took it away. Yeah. Wow. So they're going to reinstitute it for Firefall because that is insane. Crazy. They block yeah. off certain parking lots because people park everywhere. I got trapped one time because they parked illegally. It's yeah insane man and so they took it away so i'm a little upset about that so i'm kind of curious about how it's going to be i mean i don't spend much time in the valley in the summertime anyways because mm -hmm. of how crazy it is i don't want to get mad <laughs> so yeah. i'll go yeah i'll go to the backside because there's the road called tiago road and that's where i spend most of my time on all those hikes and they're okay. a lot longer so most people aren't going to do those hikes anyways so i probably won't see anybody and even if i do see people it's going to be legit people who are already respecting the land which is cool yeah but so to something i wanted to ask you do you have a favorite photo you've taken is there a favorite one or is it too hard to pick um it's kind of hard to narrow it down to just one but i i i do have a few that i would i would call my favorite just from like the story behind the photo you know, that's what I was going to say. Probably um, if you can find a favorite, tell me one that maybe holds the most best memory. Yeah. So one of my, one of my favorites, um, there's this really, really neat old barn that's sits at the foot of the, the mountains in our area. And it's a pretty popular spot for, uh, people to get, get photographs. And, um, it's off this, just off the highway down this dirt road. And there's, um, you know, there's like, uh, farmer's fields on either sides of it. And, the the, uh, the barns out in the field and you get a nice backdrop with the mountains behind it. 
And so I, I would park there and I was walking down the road and, you know, trying to line up a, a shot and the, the, uh, I'm not sure if it was like an alfalfa field or what, but the, the grass hadn't been cut and it was, you know, probably chest height on me and I'm walking and all oh, of wow. a sudden, um, like I see this, there's a, a little tiny airport nearby that, uh, um, is for, you know, small, small planes and there's this plane that's kind of circling the over the barn and it keeps flying over and um i'm like oh i'm gonna get it right when it flies over the barn and i get a nice shot of the the barn mountains plane and so i'm i'm walking down the road and uh, all of a sudden i spook these deer out of the the grass and they take off running out towards the barn and uh, it's like right as the plane flies over. And so I got this really awesome shot of the deer in the foreground and then the barn in the middle ground. And then you got the uh, mountains in the background. And then there's this plane hanging out in the sky right above it all. And I just, I just love it because it's, you know, it wasn't planned. And um, I don't think I could have, you know, tried to plan something better myself, but I think it just goes to show you that uh, you never know when when you're going to get that great shot. You know, a lot of it might happen by accident, and uh, you just have to have to put yourself in the position and be out there. And um, I think like those once in a lifetime shots will come to you if you're just out there and put yourself in that position. I 100% agree. You see all these professional photographers. It's a banger every time, man. You're like, dude, how did these guys just keep capturing bangers? Well, first of all, they have the skills to be able to capture these shots. Mm -hmm. Second of all, they're able to spend days on end at these locations. They might yeah. go to the spot, same spot five times. And they're there at the right place, right time. It might be on the fifth day that they capture those perfect conditions. Yep. So I think half the battle is tuning your skills. The other half of the battle is being at the right place right time knowing yes. when the conditions might light up because mm -hmm. conditions can make or break your photo i mean you can do the best editing in the world but if you don't have great conditions it's not going to do a whole lot right yeah i agree man just half the battles just being in the position to take the photograph yeah and being in the right place right time exactly so um you know that's what i try to do as well i spent i think i spent 35 days in glacier this year um and you know got so many great photographs um you know i go to a location that i went to last year and was kind of just meh. but you know this year there was a moose there you know and there's always like i feel like you can always get a better better picture if you just kind of re keep revisiting those those sites it's like there's always something extra or something different that can happen that'll give you a a different photo, a more unique photo. And, uh, it's just about getting out there. I agree hundred percent. I've been to some locations many times in a row. I've gotten a shot. I've been happy with almost every time I look at the shot. Okay. Why didn't it do also, why didn't it do good? So mm -hmm. I go back another time. I try it differently. I try it differently. I try it differently until you finally or in that right spot to take that photo. And then sometimes the conditions light up too. So you've taken it yeah. 20 times. Yeah. Conditions weren't good. Yeah. You messed up the exposure. You messed up the comp. And then you come on that 21st time. You you know what you're going to take. And then the conditions light up on top of it. It's just, it, to me, it seems like it all plays together into one. Mm -hmm. You said you spent 35 days. And that leads me into to this. The splash water effects on your, some of your photos, man. You're pretty much famous for that on your account, Instagram account. It's epic. So are you the one throwing the rocks or is that your brother doing that? So that's me. And it's, okay. it's, <laughs> dude, I mean, I, you're famous for it, man. You, you're like, yeah. that's one of your, that's one of your trademarks at this point. I do. I do love doing the water drop photography. I think it, I don't know. It just kind of, you go to a, a location and it's like, okay, a thousand people today have taken the same photo standing from the, the beach here at the lake looking at the mountains it's like how can how can i make a more interesting more unique shot and so yeah. i think that's a really really easy way to um to do that 
and it's it's all done by me. So <laughs> I get a lot of questions <laughs> while I'm taking the photos because it probably looks so awkward as I'm, you know, holding my camera inches from the water, trying not to like get it submerged. And at the same time, um, the the depth of field is so shallow that it's like I'm dropping stuff from the top, trying to get the splash in the right spot. And like when I first started doing it, I, pro <laughs> I probably <laughs> would take a thousand photos just to get one. You know, I've kind of dialed in my process a little bit more. But okay. um, at the first time it was like it was <laughs> it was a not a fun time when I'd come back and have to cull through photos to try and find yeah that you know that perfect shot mm -hmm. you know i could imagine that i mean i've never thought about it like that i mean i'm always trying to take unique shots of all these locations i mean i live next to yosemite sequoia i mean every shot that you can think of has been taken man almost every shot and then you try to just find something just a little bit different to make it your own shot first of all it's always going to be your own shot because you took it mm -hmm. but second of all you can add an element change the comp just a tad bit to make it your yeah. own so i like the idea of adding that splash effect in there because i know photographing lakes can be a hard one to make your own composition because mm -hmm. especially if you're in an area where like the trees and the bushes are not a lot close by where the lake opens up right for right. the balance in the background yeah so adding that little texture foreground with the splash that yeah makes a lot of sense that's clever man i like your thought process behind that and i, I know i had to ask that was like <laughs> First one of my number one questions I wanted to ask you. I mean, every time I see it, I'm like, oh, that's Jordan. If yep. anyone else does it, I don't know who else would do it. You pretty much own a fall that does that, man. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's like you said, when you go to a lake, it's like sometimes it's hard to uh, – a lot of the times I'll kind of try to get back and be like, okay, how can I use the trees or the foliage to frame the shot? You know, or how, did, how can I make the foreground more interesting? Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's, you know, the, the setting just doesn't, doesn't mm -hmm. lend itself to that. So I, I, I do the, the splash to make it a little more interesting. Mm -hmm. So I used to think that you were only a photographer. I knew you like, you posted like reels and stuff like that, but I didn't mm -hmm. realize how much you were in the video, which I think is awesome. And I'm just kind of curious when you go to these locations, are you going for photography or for video? Or do you kind of just go and say, I'm going to do both? Or are you saying, all right, this is a photography trip. This is a video trip. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about like days for work. I'm just talking about your fun days. Yeah. Um, it's usually a mixture of both. I think uh, if, <laughs> if you've ever seen me on the, the trail, I probably look a little odd because you know if i'm hiking i've got my you know one camera clipped to my my pack that's got you know my my wide to mid-range lens i've got my camera with my one to 400 telephoto slung around my my chest and then i might be wearing a gopro you know that's videoing yeah that's <laughs> so great, yeah. sometimes i get a little overzealous and just trying to be like okay i need to be I need to like capture everything on this trip just so I can remember it and, ha and all the yeah. memories. And, um, so a lot of the times I might have three cameras out at once, um, and just be constantly rotating through them. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the GoPro for a, an easy wide, you know, sweeping shot of a, uh, mm -hmm. a hike, you know, cause we're in a bowl and it, you know, the mountains are towering above us. Um, or, you know, switch to my, my, my mid range lens and get some shots of my, my brother or somebody hiking. Um, and then the telephoto, maybe zoom in on a, on yeah. a, uh, uh, a mountain peak, but I, I'm constantly rotating through the, the photo and video too. So it's like one, one camera photo, one camera video, next camera video, you know? So I, I feel like I try to try to keep a good balance. Um, so it's, yeah, usually when I go out, it's not, not, uh, not really focused on one thing in particular, unless it's, um, you know, going out to, to shoot a Milky Way shot or, you know, to do Northern lights or something like that, where right. 
I or a bucket list shot where there you know there have been times where I've been like okay I've seen a photo of this place from here but what would it look like from up here and I'll make a note mm-hmm. you know and it's it's in my little bucket list um notes and uh I might go out and try to you know capture that that shot how I imagined it and a lot of the times I come away you know feeling really happy f- because I came up with the idea and planned it and you know waited months for the the conditions to line up and go and do it so a lot of the times it's it's photo and video but sometimes you know you go out with a purpose and you do want to you know check one of those bangers off your bucket list yes sir so what is your gear set up like are you a sony user or are you canon and what cameras are you using what i heard you mentioned your mid-rate lens and your telephoto um what's your setup like yeah so i shoot all sony um i Team have sony, a baby let's go <laughs> yeah <laughs> i have a sony a7 III, which is kind of just like my backup camera now um i've got the sony a7 IV, which is my main camera um that one's a you know beast with photos and i have for, it right now yeah yeah, yeah. and Love then it. for for video, I will use my Sony A7S III. That thing's got 240 frames a second slow motion. So you get some beautiful shots with that. Yeah, yeah. So nice, bro. So yeah. nice. And uh, like my lenses, I two lenses I primarily use are um, my Tamron. Uh, it's a, I think it's a 28 to 75. That's my my, my kind of wide to mid uh, lens that's yeah. on my on my camera 80 percent of the time and then like i said that that camera that i have on my chest is usually the the one to 400 on the a7 III. you know just in case a mm-hmm. a bear scampers out in the trail or something i just want to be want to be quick to be able to grab a photo of it and then for night shots a lot of my astro photos are done with uh i have a samyang 12 millimeter and um it's a f2 and it's a manual focus so getting the stars to to be like crispy and in focus is really easy it's awesome it's like it has a dial on it you can you can set it to um, focus to infinity and so your stars are always super crispy and sharp and that the f2 keeps the um the stop down so that you can you know keep your iso Ooh, down yeah. so it's it's nice i get some nice shots with that so this leads to me one of my last questions does gear matter yeah i think it it does and it doesn't um i think you can if you have the the skills you can make exceptional work out of um you know gear that might not be very expensive um but you know there's the other side of it where you can you can do a lot more with a a camera that has more features um and uh one of the things i love is slow motion and i think that comes from filming sports for so long oh yeah and uh so that the 240 frames per second slow motion on the the a7s3 is just that's my bread and butter like a lot of the times i'm I'm filming at 240 if I'm going to film at all. That's and so nice. Like, yeah. And I just think like having, having those, uh, those different options and those different things available to you creatively helps you tell a story, um, in different ways. And so, you know, you might, I'll go back to the power of video and uh, you know, if you've ever seen like a slow motion shot set to some beautiful music that will probably evoke a different emotion than um, you know, something shot in 30 frames a second to a different piece of music. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm not going to give you a definitive yes or no gear matters. I think it's, it's up to the individual and um you can you can make a lot happen with less but you can make more happen with more 
I guess would be my answer. I know the common saying is uh, gear doesn't matter until, until it does. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Um, I try to explain to other people that you don't have to buy the best lens. So I have the G Master series. And the only reason I bought, I kept buying G Masters because I bought really expensive ND filters that fit oh. my, my 24 to 70. I bought the Peter McKinnon ones, right? Mm -hmm. And those are not cheap. Right? <laughs> yeah. So I'm not trying to buy a Tamron wide angle lens and have to buy a whole new set of filters that are going to cover that that thread. So I ended right. up buying the G Master 16 to 35 lens. Mm -hmm. So I can use the same filters on the same lenses. Yeah. And maybe I maybe I could have saved money by buying a cheap filter and a cheaper lens, but I just wanted to keep it all the same and uh yeah. make it flow nice. But dude, my a lot of my friends shoot on Tamron. I the pictures you can't tell the difference. No. It's like only <laughs> <laughs> it's like a uh like food critics. Like there's only I feel like there's only a certain percentage of people in the population that are going to be able to tell and be like, Oh no, the edges aren't sharp as sharp as like a G master lens. This must've been I, a jam run, but Oh yeah. I've watched know. the breakdowns of those. I'm like, bro, how did you even right, know right. that? Yeah. <laughs> I watch them too. And the, the only thing they teach me is that I don't care that much. Like, all right, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm, I'm still going to shoot yeah. with this and um, get high quality photos out of it. That's awesome, man. So closing out, what advice would you give to a beginner creative, whether it's photographer, or videographer? I mean, I've been at it technically for five years, but seriously, maybe for the last two, maybe, what would you say to someone just starting out? They picked up their first camera or maybe they haven't yet. What would you tell them? Like, what advice would you give them? You've been at it for many years. Yeah, I think... I don't know. Part of it loops back to my, my story about the deer and the, the plane and the, the barn. And it just comes down to getting out and shooting and putting yourself in the position to, to get the good shots. And, um, if you want to look at it, like in a business sense, um, it, what helps me stay passionate about, um, wildlife and landscape photography, but also make a living at it is having, um, you know, two sides to my, to my business where I, you know, I, I do film for corporations and I do, you know, kind of the, the video work that's not, not as fun and not as I might not be as passionate about it, but it helps me support my passions. And so, you know, I started, started with sports highlight films for free for my high school and, you know, worked my way up. I was doing weddings and then, you know, got, got hooked up with a guy and, you know, started doing documentaries and it just kind of grew from there. And I would just say, if you're passionate about it, just, just keep doing it, you know, find somebody else who's, who's passionate about it. And you, you'll both kind of rely on each other. You'll both, motivate each other a lot of the times when i'm not thinking about going and taking photos my brother's like hey let's go shoot and i'll be like okay you know and vice versa and so having having a buddy an accountability buddy to to get you uh up and moving and out taking photos is really helps as well i think that's a huge part of it a lot of people don't talk about that part the accountability buddy so my girlfriend She's not in the photography. She's not in the video, but she knows how much I like it. Yeah. So there's days when I'm not motivated. I'm not inspired, but yeah, she's like, Nick, you got to go. Yeah. Like in order for you to get recharged and be inspired again, you actually have to go out there and go take those photos to feel inspired again. Yeah. What happens when I go out there and take photos and I'm out in nature? I come back home, I'm all excited. All right, let's go. I'm yeah. ready for the next time I'm ready. Let's go, baby. I'm ready. I'm excited. So how many times did she have to uh, uh, inspire you for your your uh, 100 sunrises? Oh, bro. <laughs> a lot. She's yeah. not a morning person. She's not a morning person either. So she is an angel for that. She sleeps yeah. on the way up there. 
she doesn't like the morning, but she goes to me because one, she wants to make sure I don't die on the hikes. Sure. <laughs> and two, she just wants to make sure that she's there to support me and make sure I get it done. So mm-hmm. I think having her there to help me out with that was huge. And I'm also glad that it's over because <laughs> yeah. I can now go I can now go to the mountains and be more intentional and focus on telling more stories sure. than just going up there because I have to Go watch a sunrise, even though it was fun. I mean, right. I was able to see a lot more sunrises than I would have ever gone to see. Yeah. So, closing this out, where can the people find you on Instagram? Are you on TikTok? I am. Yep, yeah. I'm on Instagram. Okay. I'm on Facebook, TikTok, um, and I have a YouTube channel that doesn't have much on it, but I think uh, my brother and I are going to be adding some more stuff. We've got some things that we're planning this this year we're working on a fly fishing film right now and i think we might work on some other short films throughout the year so any of those any of those things you can find me on what's the app for tiktok or instagram tiktok i think they're all jordan leffler so jordan leffler yep if you type in my name uh instagram is at jordan leffler facebook is jordan leffler Montana adventure photographer. TikTok is uh, Jordan Leffler photo is my TikTok. And then my YouTube is Jordan Leffler. Awesome, man. Jordan, thanks again for coming on here. This You're my first podcast host. I know you're my first podcast interviewee. So I'm happy that you were the first one. I was excited because you're not from where I live. So I really wanted to get your perspective on things. I mean, you live in an awesome place and keep posting those great photos man i mean you inspire me and i'm probably gonna be asking you questions later on to business advice stuff like that because i'm just joining joining your world right now yeah awesome nick thank you i appreciate it i'm honored that i'm your first guest seriously dude this is awesome so i hope hope this takes off for you and you get some more more awesome people on here and um this turns out to be a really cool thing